All right, here we go. Oops, position the camera better. Um, hi, welcome to these uh, self-love revolution classes. My name is Barry Selby teaching this week, it's around level two of getting your house in order. Um, by way of introduction, I am a um, love and relationship expert, best-selling author, speaker, inspirational teacher, um, spiritual guide, and a bunch of other things on my resume. Um, <laughs> I've been doing this work for about 15 years, I've been on the personal growth journey since the mid 80s. So I've done this work for a long, long time, hence the gray hair. And um, I'm also really discovered the work over the last several years with my clients, even though helping them find amazing relationships, it always starts with a relationship with self. And so I've become more, um, I've become less subtle about my focus on telling people you need to work on yourself because that's what I've been doing for the last 35, 40 years. So what I'm teaching is stuff that I've, uh, I've been through, I've practiced, I've broken, I've fixed, I've learned and grown from, and I help my clients do the same thing. So to recap from last week, I used the letters and I'm using the word house to break into five categories. And last time um, the words I used were um, H, one or two houses spelt, but it's about health, which is emotional and mental health. Um, ownership of owning your own space, your own values, your own beingness, understanding about really supporting yourself by standing under what you believe and also how to gain understanding of the world and what you're about. Uh, Self-support, which branched into self-love, self-care as well, but how to take care of yourself and support yourself in your journey. And then expression about really speaking your truth and stepping into the world. That was kind of what I talked about last time. Again, the replay is available, so you can watch that if you want to see the whole in-depth explanation in the Q&A. This week, I've got a whole new five teachings to go through. <laughs> so we'll dive in. And uh, if you have questions along the way, you can you know, raise your hand or un unmute yourself and ask questions. Um, and at the end, we'll do a, more of a, a Q&A as well. So the five letters this week, we'll start with one at a time. First one I'm talking about for the H this time is, called, is simply help. And help is one of these also um, two-sided things because one of it is is to really make sure you get the help you need, which can be inward and outward, as in you can listen to your own inner voice and trust your inner guidance to get the help from inside because most of us um, forget that we have a lot of inner guidance that we can re rely on and get help from. Also get the help outside. I mean, I'm not necessarily touting my own services. However, if you're in this group and you're listening to all the speakers, there are plenty of people teaching things um, that I love dearly. They're great people in this group teaching that you can get help from. And so don't be shy about getting, you know, reaching out for support, booking sessions, getting help. Um, even as going to books and other teachings too. I mean, I recommend my book personally because I'm biased about it, but getting help that way too. The second part of help though, is when you've been doing this work for a while, it's almost paramount that you start learning how to help others with it. Because one of the things I've learned over the years is the best way for me to learn what, to, excuse me, to integrate what I've learned is to practice it by helping others with it. I mean, one reason I'm, I'm coaching is because I've learned so much over the years that the best way I can keep it fresh and working for me is to help other people with it. So giving of your own skills, your mastery, your own talents um, is a powerful thing. In fact, one of my, um, which one was it? I don't know what it was now. I mean, I, I've done a lot of seminars over the years just to be transparent. And in one of them, it talks about how as a, to be in this work is a requirement that is, let me say this, it's like imagine you're climbing a ladder or climbing a mountain. We all, but we basically have two hands. One of those hands is to reach up above us to help other, to get help from other people, helping us climb up that hill. So it's being, we're reaching up for support. At the same time, we have the other hand to reach down below us to help people who yet to catch up to where we are. So we can help other people get to where we are as well. So help is a two-way street, so to speak. And it's a vital piece, I believe, of what we do. Um, I tend to use the terms assisting or serving or in my work coaching, but help is the same thing. So how do you help others? Um, and sidebar, I think that's the last time, is to make sure you give when you can give from your overflow versus give to get something back. So helping the same way is when you're helping other people, you know, helping them so you feel better or helping them so you get something from them. You help because you're already filled up and you can give comfortably and you can help easily from other people. So that's the help piece. That's an easy one to talk about initially. Um, let's see where the other ones go, shall we? So the second one, 
the O is optimism. And I'm speaking to this one because this past year has not been a very good place to be optimistic for most people. Um, it's been challenging for a lot of people. And I've had, I mean, I look back in my life and realize I've had a very optimistic, and I explain what I mean in more depth about optimism. It's not just, not just Pollyanna viewpoint. It's really about understanding optimism is deeper than that. And this, I realize over most of my life, I've had things happen where I came out the other side. Usually I came out pretty optimistic because what I saw, what happened may have been negative, but then something ended up happening was better than what I could have had. One of my bless, one of the blessings in my life, which I think is true of all of us, I just know from myself, it's a great experience, is oftentimes my first choice didn't work, but my second choice did. And oftentimes the second choice was better than the first one once I got there. I talked about this with my career. Um, I wouldn't be in this country, wouldn't be in the United States if I hadn't given up the first choice I was given as a job to do the one I did that led me to the United States, um, circuitously. I, I, my college life, you know, if I graduated with the degree in my college when I was in college, I probably would have become very academic and never learned anything along the way because I went to a polytechnic because my grades weren't high enough to be in a um, university back in England. Um, my my O levels and A levels. I went to a polytechnic, which is like a trade school. And so I spent a year in, in computer. I was a computer programmer, by the way. I've had seven careers before this. <laughs> That's another story for another time, maybe. In my um, college year, because I didn't do more than one year, you basically go to college for you, then you go to work, and then you come back for a year, and you go back to work, and you come back for a year. So it's, three, it's four years total with six months in between the three years of, of academic. Um, I had too much fun in my first year. And so... I didn't do as well in my, my exams as I could have done. I, I was on computers and back in, this is going back to the, well, I'm dating myself now. Um, it, was, it was the late 70s, I'll put it that way. So computers were big back then. They hadn't become desktops and laptops and everything else. This is the big mainframe stuff. And I was fascinated by these things. So I played a lot. And literally, because we developed some computer games back then that were very, mon very um, what's the word before? They, they were very simple, I'll put it that way, because we didn't have much technology at our fingertips back then. And we didn't, you know, our computers weren't very high speed. You know, phone, the iPhone we have now, or the, on the Android, is light years ahead of what we had back then. At the time, I was fascinated. So to cut to the chase, at, when it came to the end of our first year, we went through a list of academic of, um, placements we could go into for employment for the six months we were going to be out working. And the first choice that came up, I was given, was working for um, Marconi Radar. I remember now, Marconi Radar was a local company in Essex where I was born and raised. That was a small research company doing a lot of radar, very technical stuff. And it sounded so boring. So I said, no. And, you know, there's, but there were probably, I don't remember what placements were, but there were 30 some kids, some um, students in our group that were getting placed. And so I said, no, well, I went to the back of the line at that point. So everybody else was getting placed through the list and it's going down to where I was one of the last ones. I was starting to get nervous. I mean, you know, I didn't know this stuff at the time. And what ended up happening is I got placed for a computer software company uh, off of Oxford Street in London, like right off the main shopping area. And it was commercial programming versus scientific programming. And the first thing I got when I went into the job was they sent me to work in Hamburg in the German office. So already my life has changed. I've already traveled internationally. I'm in a different sort of business. And frankly, what happened was when I was working in commercial programming back then, they said to me that basically what's more important than academic education is experiential education. So they said, basically, you can go back to college if you want, but I recommend you stay in the job because you'll get more benefits and you'll progress faster in your career this way. Turns out that wasn't quite so true, but I did that anyway. So the thing was, first of all, I was having much more fun than I was doing the other job I would take in. Secondly, I was getting to travel internationally, which is way cool, which I hadn't done the other job. And thirdly, I was getting paid more. <laughs> back then so so the point i was a teacher is the fact is that sometimes you say no to the first thing the second thing can be better i've experienced that multiple times using that as an example um, but i've had that with job opportunities with housing locations with travel opportunities all sorts of things i've had in my life where the second choice was better than the first choice so optimism that's the one I'm talking about here is being less invested in the fix or should say less fixated on our choices one thing's about optimism for me is being more fluid in what happens, being more flexible in what happens, because frankly, we get lots and lots of opportunities in life. And sometimes we just go, damn, I missed it. You know, one, one, of, one of my teachers talks about how optimism 
excuse me, opportunity. I get no, I was mixed up here. Opportunity doesn't come along once in a while. Opportunity, so I say, you say opportunity knocks once. Like no, opportunity will knock the door down if you listen to it. So being optimistic is really recognizing that abundance of opportunity is available. That things that may not work one time, if it looks bad initially, be willing to look to see if something different showing up. I've had, as I said, multiple experiences, and I just gave you one where I looked at something as being, oh crap, this is going to be terrible because something didn't work out or something, some, some conversation really, really badly or whatever it was. And the next day something happened that was so much better than the first one. So I'm an adamant believer in second chances. And so for me, optimism comes naturally now, not again, Pollyanna, but just from experience. And so I'm just going to tell you that you can be optimistic in what's going on in your life, whether it's health or relationship or career or whatever it is, as long as you're willing to listen to what's happening and be observant of what's happening and also hold the space of being open to possibilities because when you are open to possibilities, what's great, you might be surprised by what shows up. That's autism. Third one. This one I was playing with, I was thinking, you know, use an, you is an interesting word to find. Um, what's the word? Um, words that fit start with you. The one that came up right away when I was sitting with it was unattached. Um, or in other words, detachment. One of the things that comes up for me in the optimistic piece, and I said about how being in the flow and being willing to, to um, be open to possibilities, is being unattached means you're not fixated on certain things. Um, I've had a death grip on certain things I wanted so badly and they didn't work out. I got really upset and disappointed. So I've learned over the years to become much more fluid and be detached about my own. Um, sorry, I'm just going to do, 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 do. Just point to the thing here because I was watching the, the mic bouncing. Whoops, that was the wrong thing. Sorry, keep, I'll talk, talk amongst yourselves. No. <laughs> um, no, that's what I was doing wrong. There we go. Okay. Um, sorry, continuing on. <clears throat> the place of being unattached for me was knowing how it's more fun to play. Some people look at unattachment being somehow numb or, or um, uh, un, like non participating, like holding off. For me, being unattached means I get to play more easily. And I mean this in the literal sense of playing in life, but also the energetic sense of being able to play inside. Because being unattached, there's um, a book that I recommend if you haven't read it, or listen to the audio book, um, by Michael A. Singer called The Untethered Soul. Um, I'm actually, I'd actually recommend his other book, which is called The Surrender Experiment, which is, I think is a great book. If you want to know how people's lives can transform, like I shared about how I got better opportunity because what happened became better than that. If you, want to, if you want a book that will teach you a powerful lesson of this, I recommend The Untethered so, excuse me, I recommend The Surrender Experiment by Michael A. Singer. You, both these books are great. The, the um, Surrender Experiment was a book that talks about his life story. It's basically an autobiography, but it's written in a, such an intending way and his life adventures because of things that didn't happen and did happen are a demonstration of detachment and optimism because he's had some, an amazing life over his years. And then the, um, the untethered soul is about the spiritual connection. So for me, detachment or being unattached is a place of being flexible with what's happening and being in the flow. And I'm a big fan, as you may have guessed, in living that way because it's much easier. And so that um, well, let me use another example. I just don't want to show up. If you're on social media, you might discover how people have very, very uh, definite opinions about things. And I've had friendships that I thought were very valid to me, people who have, let's just say, got a very different perspective to me about the way life is. Let's just speak about the politics, the health, everything else that's going on right now. And I've had to become very unattached because I love these people dearly, but I cannot comfortably get in conversation with them because they're so caught up in their own perspective. So for me, being unattached has been a relief, <laughs> to be honest, because I love them from a distance, not being so invested in them. And you may have that discovery with some of your relationships where being unattached gives you freedom because you're not so caught up in the need to be close to that person. 
I've had to step back from some of my friendships because of this. And it's been a much easier process because I know this skill now. I've learned this way of being unattached. Let me qualify this. It doesn't mean you're not invested. One of the things I've, I was taught many years ago about how to have what you want is to have a high, in, high um, investment but low attachment. So being able to be unattached does not mean you don't participate, doesn't mean you don't play. It means that you really are not attached to the result being a certain way so you can actually have more fun with it. So for me, unattachment gives more joy and more ease with what life is about. So it's a powerful, simple, in quotes, key to this. So now I'm going to move on to the S. And I was, I was tempted to go back to all the different, the self-love, self-care, self-support, all, self, all these different things. But what came up actually more important than that was what I would call safety. And I'm using safety in a special way, um, <clears throat> tying it together with security. Because we can do better with taking care of ourselves. And what, I've dis what I was talking about was actually on a podcast, the replay came out yesterday, about codependency. Um, it's been a passion of mine to talk about codependency in my work because it's a trap we all fall into because we're, we're raised with it in our culture and our families. And one of the things about safety is to really start to bring, bring back, like some of it last, last time is self-support and self-love, to trust ourselves. Because one of the things about safety is we oftentimes think we have to make sure everything else is safe around us. But what we fail to recognize is that safety begins within. And I'm going to get to security in a minute. But safety for me is when you can feel safe in your emotional space, in your mental space, and your physical space, all three. In fact, let me throw in spirituality as well because that undergirds everything we do and all the things I work, all the work I do. Safety is... Well, it's a few things. It's trusting what's going on and trusting yourself. Because when you are trusting your emotional state and trust your emotional expression and trust your mental state and your physical ability to move in the world, you feel safe in that. And safety is one of these things that people forget about, which is why people end up being in toxic relationships. They end up in toxic jobs. They end up having uh, things happen in their lives where they don't feel safe. Uh, and let me say this way. I've noticed a lot in the news and the media recently, because maybe it's because of the lockdown, because of everything else. There's a lot more um, neg negative things happening locally, like, like, like fights breaking out. I mean, uh, this is in LA and it's been weird anyway. But there's been fights breaking out, people being attacked or people being shot or, or cars um, getting car accidents and stuff. A lot's been happening more recently than, the, than previously. Yet none of that's close to me. I mean, maybe geographically not too far away, but I'm not thinking, I'm not feeling at risk because one of the things I'm aware of is because we do create our reality, which I'm sure you've heard before in this group from other teachers, is that safety is an, in, in a, an internal game, so to speak. I keep my wits about me. You know, I'm not a ride a bike, but I wear a helmet because you, know, you never know what's going to happen. But at the same time, I don't ride scared. I ride safely. So I watch where I'm going, watch where I've been, I keep my eyes open. And yes, there are things outside of my control, but to this point, I've been safe because I keep that mindset going on. So not just when you're out in the world, but internally, is do you watch yourself talk and how you feel to maintain the sense of safety? And I'm speaking to this point of view that oftentimes we um, run negative fantasies about things. I used to do this a long time ago, thankfully not anymore, where you run doubts and worries and fears about something happening. And it tends to start outpicturing. There's um, a term I've used a lot from my own experience as well called how um, external experience is a reflection of internal reality. An outside experience, is that what I said? An outside experience is, an, is a reflection of internal reality, meaning that we create our reality. If you don't need work with, course, with, um, well, of course, America talks about it too, but also in Abraham Hicks and um, the teachings of the law of attraction, it's the way it works. What happens out there is started by what happens in here. So if you start not being safe internally, you then start creating a reality out there. It's not safe either. So you have dominion over your world, as crazy as it sounds. You certainly have dominion over your experience. So to really start anchoring in safety inside, which 
I can tell you there's a bunch of different things about, which includes that stuff I talked about last time with self-support, self-love, self-care, etc. then you become safe. Because what's happening is you take care of yourself. And it's going to sound, um, I'll put this together. I talk about a lot about how you take care of yourself. I did this last time. Take care of yourself, first thing, take care of others. By having self-care as a priority, you feel comfortable inside your own skin. And when you start to um, build up that self-support, I feel like there are batteries of self-care, self, self-support, self self-love, then you feel safer. Because a lot of times we don't feel safe because we're not taking care of ourselves. Our safety we put on other people because we want them to take care of us versus ourselves. And as I said last time, I'm adamant about this, is we have to take care of ourselves first. Because when we do that, then life gets easier. And so the safety is almost a, a barometer you can use to gauge how well you're taking care of yourself. If you don't feel safe, where are you not taking care of yourself? You can play with it that way by using safety as your guide of how comfortable you are in your own skin. So there's a few other ways you can play with safety, but that's the one I want to use in this case. And so it's a piece that I want to really make sure you get because it's, it's a useful skill. So that's that one. And the last of the five, and then we'll get to Q&A and stuff as well. Um, the e, last time I used the word was expression. This time I'm going to use the word energy. And I'm using the word energy because it's something that I've become acutely aware of the last several months is about where I, one, where I put my energy and two, how I sustain my energy. How do I fill it up? How do I take care of myself? And for me, it's been, a, been something I've, I've not done until, well, I started doing it after the lockdown happened. One of the things I committed to without realizing was, is I start, and this is one thing I've got a habit of doing, when I start doing something, I just have to keep doing it without thinking about it, is I go out and exercise every day. I go, for a, I go out for a walk or a bike ride or a hike or something like that. And actually, since I got my, my, um, my Apple Watch about, was it October? I've now got a, now got a built-in trainer. So I actually make, now make sure I do it because it keeps reminding me, which is kind of great. So I've got a, and a habit built in because it, it, it would, this thing dings me and goes, time to get up, do it, you know, stand up, walk around. So I've made that a priority for myself. And so my life now is fit where I'm taking care of myself and I'm able to go out and do exercise every day. It's not like I'm going to the gym because the gym's going open. I'm not like working out heavily. It's just that I keep my energy going. One reason I do it because I have become pretty good at doing sourdough bread. It's one of the things I started doing because the lockdown requirement was to learn how to make sourdough bread. And so I was doing it as an excuse to work off the calories. But what's happened is it's become a great way of me and handling my energy. I've used it when I've been on phone calls, I've taken the, you know, going for a walk when I've been on the phone. Um, I've, been, I've been in Clubhouse a lot, which is one of my new places to play. If you've ever heard of the Clubhouse app, it's now, well, it's been out on iPhone for a while, and it's out on Android as well. And I've been in a couple of rooms where we do afternoon talks. And so I try to walk in areas where I get phone reception, but it's where I get to re really enjoy my and do things. And what I've noticed when I'm going for a walk is, a walk, is my energy gets better. Sitting in front of a computer all day, which is one of my habits, because it's when a lot of work is on my computer, my energy gets depleted. It just well, it doesn't get depleted. It just goes flat. So changing my state is one of the ways I maintain my energy. And at the same time, it helps me focus where I want to do things. Um, for me, the way I'm wired, and I know this now, is if I'm not getting something done, the best thing to do is change my state, change my energy. So to go for a walk, stretch my legs, go get some water, do something different will refresh my energetic state so I can go do what I want to do properly. So if you're somebody who finds yourself where your energy is getting depleted or you're finding yourself not getting into a to complete task the way you want to, look at where your energy is focused. Are you taking care of yourself? Are you listening or tuning in? And a lot of the stuff is about tuning in to how your energy is being used. And then another piece of this, just to make it more fun, is to watch your energy leakage. Yeah, it sounds funny, doesn't it? Energy leakage. Um, this goes back to the codependency piece of relationships. I'm aware that there are people around me, and they're not around me as much anymore as they used to be, who seem to suck on my energy. Like an energy, I use the term energy vampire. I mean, you've heard that term before. It's basically someone who is um, predatory in a way, but also it's somebody who doesn't necessarily take care of themselves. So one way you take care of energy is to be around, be around people less who are not taking care of themselves. And you can tell because they tend to latch onto you or tend to pull on your energy. They want you to do things for them or to listen to them or to 
you'll notice because you know your energy is getting depleted because they're, they're draining it from you in a way to fill up their own batteries because they don't know how to do it themselves. Don't do that anymore. <laughs> Simply is really learn how to keep your boundaries. Part of energy management in yourself is having boundaries. And I haven't talked about boundaries before. I don't think I did last time. But having healthy boundaries is a good way of creating a good place for your energy to build up. And I could do a probably in about a, a two-hour talk on boundaries. So I'll give a succinct version of what that is. Boundaries is part of the ability for us to simply say that our needs come first. It also means learning how to say no. One of the biggest lessons in boundaries is not saying yes to everything around you, which is draining your energy. So having healthy boundaries as a way of taking care of yourself, especially in a romantic relationship, as well as in fa- well, actually in family relationships too, is a place to get healthier in your energy management and also how you interact with other people. In fact, to um, let me just check all these things. Safety. Yes. All these things fit together. Like I'm going to do a quick, quick span of all, all five of these. So if you have healthy boundaries, first of all, your energy is maintained and managed so you take care of yourself. Secondly, you start feeling safer because you know where you say yes and where you say no because you have a cleaner alignment of your agreement keeping. You also have a detachment to other people's needs and wants because you're not as attached to what they want or to feel for their approval or their um, happiness. One of the biggest things when you set up boundaries is other people may not be happy and it's not your problem. Again, your energy gets maintained inside yourself. If you have the, uh, the additional energy to give us an overflow, you can go help them, make them feel happy if you want to. But don't be addicted to that because that drains your own batteries. So being unattached is a key part of that too. And then as you are feeling safer inside your own healthy boundaries, you can be more optimistic because you're not being focused on the negative. You choose where you put your energy, where you put your attention, where you focus yourself, which then isn't a very way to, that, to be blunt, it's an optimistic way of living life. Being optimistic, by the way, is again, not polyandrish. Polyanrish, being like a Pollyanna, where you're but you're making things, things light all the time. Um, sidebar on that one. I have some friends, as I mentioned, who I've become less around because they've become very fixated on certain rules. And being optimistic does not um, have me ignore that. I'm aware of the people who are out there who are not being happy. I'm aware of the way the world is not working perfectly, the way it could be, you know, where something's working, some things are not. I'm aware of some of the challenges we're facing. But I'm still optimistic because I believe we can fix some of these things. And things we can't, I'm not going to get depressed about. So in terms of works that way, again, being watch where your energy goes. And then back to the beginning, which is the help piece, is when you're feeling like your energy is not being sustained, get some help, whether that's getting help from somebody else or taking, getting help from yourself by going to meditate or going for a walk or eating healthy food or drinking water, whatever that is for you that is a restorative method to get the help you need. And then, of course, you can help other people. But again, because you have healthy boundaries and you're watching your own energy, you only help other people when you know you've got the ability and the freedom to do so without defeating yourself first. So that's a quick reverse through the, through the HOUSE structure. Use some thoughts. So that's this week's, this time's teaching um, five-point system. So any questions, thoughts, and comments you want to make? I know Joanne's been making notes because I've been seeing her scribbling down all the time, <laughs> constantly. So anyone, any questions or comments? I love it. I totally love it. I don't have any questions, but um, I, uh, I have had to drop friends as well. They've, um, the people who are codependent or too needy and, you know, they don't want to go inside and um, use their own uh, strengths. Um what how did you say that um yeah the safety part they're so they're feeling so unsafe and so and they're looking for other people to you know keep them safe and how come you didn't do this for me i needed you or whatever it's just like oh my god (laughs) and um so over time i've had to let people go uh for for all of these reasons that you that you talked about and uh, and i knew that it was the right thing to do because they were energy suckers and they were too codependent. They were toxic and they didn't want to do things for themselves. They, they wanted everybody else around them to, to take care of them. Mm-hmm. So, um, you know, I can't be a caretaker like that. That's not healthy. And I really like the, the part about having the healthy, the healthy boundaries, because it's true. It gets us out of um, situations that aren't good. 
and the detachment. Oh yeah, I totally hear you. Um, I'm in a group every Saturday for adult children of alcoholics and um, mm -hmm. it's a 12 step group and we go over all of that kind of stuff. And I've gone to, um, I've gone to, a, to a treatment place many, many years ago for codependency. And it was so good. I'm so glad I went. That was like probably, geez, close to 30 years ago. Mm -hmm. um, and it was so good. And I knew that I, that I needed the help. And after I went there, everything started to change. I just started to detach, get, 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 um, get more safe within my being and, you know, all of this growing, I'm still growing, but I've really come far. So I, I, I really like what you're saying and I, I believe what you're saying and I practice that too. Wonderful. Thank you, Joanne. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Anybody else? Oh, and you raise your hand. I, I, I didn't notice that feature in Zoom. <laughs> yeah, I, I raised my hand. Um, no, I'm an adult child of an alcoholic father. And that has been an issue for me too about codependence and um, being a people pleaser has a lot to do with it. And I, I consider myself a recovering people pleaser because I always mm -hmm. came last, always put everyone else first. And, you know, um, there's a fear factor in that too. And I've, I've, I've actually had to weed out some very toxic relationships with friends. And it's, it was painful for me to do that, but I thought it was my, my own well being that I had to do that. Um, I have a current situation with my landlord and she's going through a divorce and she's turned really toxic. Mm. And I try to distance myself from her because of that. I'm, I'm noticing the patterns from my childhood from that type of stuff happening with other people that I know, and I sense that and I automatically take care of myself. So I, I, I don't get sucked in because I had to deal with a lot of, you know, psychic vampires, including, you know, my ex-husband was a psychic vampire. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I, I used to term energetic because it's, it's more of a wide spectrum. The truth is that, um, they'll use any means they can and so the, it sounds like i mean it sounds like now you're getting much more aware so you're choosing to fall into it mm -hmm. less easily mm -hmm. yeah i mean this this is this is deeper work i mean if i'm glad you both showed that you've been through working with groups and doing some work to it's not you're just observing you have to do something about it which is great i do because frankly yeah because if you're not doing the work they won't change so the fact you are is, is wonderful because that means you're taking you're taking conscious dominion and getting the help you need, which is ideal. So thank you for that. But I, I agree with you about um, taking time off and being in front of the computer because I'm in front of the computer all day working from home. I work mm -hmm. in tech and I'm so grateful to just take a walk outside. Yeah. It's been, my, it's been my daily commitment to myself now, and it, it does make a difference. I'm in California also. I'm not in L.A. I'm up north um, in, in the San Jose area in Silicon Valley, where we've been in lockdown also forever. Yeah. So the, so it's the lesson. I mean, I, I set aside on computer programming a long, long time ago, and I've been through several careers, but every single one of them seemed to be, well, except two, were very computer-centric. So there's definitely been a comfort with that, but also recognition that I was getting too much into that. So I just sort of stepped free and having, having like, and, and say having the watch has helped because it's like, you know, it says go stand up every like 20 minutes or every half an hour. So I just simply remind myself to go get a cup of coffee or get some water or do something else. So I'm not in front of the computer all the whole time. So it, it's the simple things we can use that can help us. So good steps. Any other questions, thoughts? Somebody said something in the chat. Oh, Carol, yeah, uh, dominion over experience. Yes, you have dominion over your experience. Again, the way I describe it, and the, what I learned was in a in a in a reality is a excuse me. Outer experience is a reflection of inner reality. That's what I'm trying to say. So, if things outside aren't working, first thing you want to check is check inside with what you're believing, what you're holding. Yeah, and that focus of your energy that that um way that you are feeling if you're feeling happy feeling sad if you're feeling 
good if feeling bad whatever that is you'll notice that the outside world seems to reflect back what's going on so use that outside experience as your indicator like oh i'm off track how can i fix that what can i do differently so you can change your state so using that alone can change your life it's a potent um sign not signpost it's a potent indicator of what's going on so definitely definitely having dominion over your experience because you can change your experience by what's going inside if you change your internal state do you you reframe or what your self-talk change how you are in relationship with yourself then what happens outside tends to change as well so any other questions thoughts i have an example of what i did for myself um, in terms of all of this. Um, so I, my sister-in-law would invite me to go to dinner to my brother's house and her place. And she's new to our family and he's, he, uh, his wife, his previous wife passed away and he got remarried. So um, they're both serious control freaks. Um, so anyway, um, she wants help to cook uh, some food that she doesn't know how to cook. Um, the way that we cook it. So she asked me to help. So sure, okay, I like cooking. I, I like cooking, I, I don't mind. So <laughs> so anyway, here, so I go and she's um, breathing down my neck constant and trying to tell me every move. And I'm like, well, I thought you invited me so that I could show you how to do it. Um, okay, so, <laughs> so anyway, she's like, oh no, use this, do this and do that and do this and do that. I'm like, well, who, okay. oh my God. So then I did that a few times and I, before I'm gonna kill her, I thought, okay, I have to change what's going on here. So then I thought about it and then I thought, okay, I'm gonna completely detach. That's the only answer. And, and I'm not even actually gonna offer any help. Mm. So now the next time she, well, I'm not even gonna to agree to helping and I'm not gonna offer. And if she invites me for dinner, I'm just gonna say sure. And I'm just gonna sit back and relax, have a drink while she's cooking and just visit with my brother. It works like a charm. Now mm -hmm. I don't even go in the kitchen. I don't even go in the kitchen. And um, I'll go there and uh, my brother will make me a drink and we'll visit and she'll be screaming and yelling from the kitchen, trying to visit with us while she's cooking. I just <laughs> let her do what she's going to do. And yep. I, I don't offer any more help anymore. And, and it, none of that, it all stopped. There you go. <laughs> so that's a good example of getting, getting detached. And I'm not, I'm not worrying about, um, you know, the outcome or, or anything. I'm just there to enjoy myself. Yeah. I had to reframe it, like you're saying, because I have to think, hey, well, when you go to dinner to somebody's house, what's the purpose? Ah, to enjoy and to visit and to catch up. And that's yeah, it's it. funny. It's funny because I, because dinner, especially with family stuff, that can be an interesting dynamic. What's already a play. You said your brother and, you, and his wife are both that level. So you're going to definitely navigate that carefully. Yeah. Yeah. And so that was the most respectful way that I could figure how to still be in their company without getting rid of them and not having them in my life anymore. Cause I have had to do that with family members because they're so sick and they haven't gotten any help and they're not in any kind of recovery of anything. And they want to continue with the real toxic behavior. So that, no, I just, no, I don't really hang out with them. When we have family functions, I'll go, but I'll stay, I'll stay away. Like I won't, won't really entertain any conversation yeah. um, I'll just listen and stay stay detached I won't really get into the conversation because then I then I might get hooked and I don't want to get hooked into an argument of some kind so yeah it's tricky it's tricky but you really but like you're saying like yes. you really have to go inside and check check yourself and to decide what you're going to do and how you're going to uh, behave and, and not react and what you're going to do with the triggers and how you're going to behave and what are you going to do with your triggers when you get triggered in that kind of environment? You know, I have to think about all that before I go to those kinds of events. Yes. Smart choice. Yeah. Mm. No, I understand. In fact, I was going to say one thing about that is that this work oftentimes almost separates us from our family all the time. Because a, lot, a lot of the toxicity as you both, as you both mentioned, is in the family dynamic. You know, the outside relationships you can walk away from more easily, but with family, you know, you sort of, there's rules you can't leave your family. Well, it's like, yes, you can. You suddenly distance yourself because you, you have the freedom to take care of yourself. Again, 
focus on your energy, take care of yourself, put yourself first in your life, and then you can serve your family. Okay, late arrivals. Um, and so have, having an understanding of where you are with that relationship that with the family is a different dynamic. And so having an understanding that you're okay with walking away or saying no to what your family wants so you can take care of yourself is, for some people, it's a big leap. But when you get there, it's like, oh, that's not so hard. Because there's this duty rules about family and, and the blood family. Um, Richard Buck wrote in, right, wrote in Illusions that um, members of the same, same family are very rarely born under the same roof. It's a recognition that family is not always about blood. Yes, there are people who you were raised with, people who raised you. But when, especially when you become an adult, you can choose who you want to spend time with. So family, family relationships, yes, Thanksgiving, whatever that is. But know that you don't have to spend your whole life with them. That's the joy of being an adult. You can choose to be with who you want. So, yeah, that's, that's the thing with families. They're, they can be great or they can be toxic. They can be everything in between. And so choosing your relationships from that point is, is, um, is a good piece. So, all right, any other questions, any thoughts? Yeah, that may be good. Beatrice, you came in a little late, so I'm not sure if, I mean, you missed the, the talk, so definitely want you to watch the replay because that's where I explained the, the five pieces. Um, if I go through them now, it's gonna probably not land so well, so I don't know. Andy, any thought, question? Yeah, I, I just want to say that I, I have a very similar family dynamic. My family is very toxic. They're very controlling and I'm sensitive and I get very triggered by all of them. And I've just learned to distance myself from them. I live like 3000 miles away from them. And I <laughs> enjoyed about that. They live in New Jersey, New York, other East Coast states. I'm originally from the East Coast. I'm originally from New Jersey. But, um, you know, they all have this group think this way of thinking that is so dysfunctional and so toxic and controlling. And I just, I just smile and act like I don't hear anything. <laughs> you know, and I, the few times I've, I've had to see them when they came to the West coast, I just managed my, you know, my experience by being in a happy space. And I feel like my face hurts so much from smiling. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, I, I just can't get into their their way of thinking. I, I yeah. feel like an alien. I felt like I was adopted because I'm like, how am I related to these people? I just I just can't I just can't relate to them at all. That's that that is one of the gifts and one of the curses of doing this, of doing the work of transforming your own life and healing. Mm -hmm. Is you start looking at your family, going, how did I come from there? Exactly. But the recognition is that you did come from there because you've you've in, I mean. This is, a, this is a way of reframing. He's looking at the gift is because if they hadn't been like that, you wouldn't have done the work you have to become the person you are now. Mm -hmm. so, so there's a blessing inside that curse, so to speak. Even though yeah. at times you're going, why would I want to do that? But yes, you, yeah. Yeah, they think I'm really weird and I'm the black sheep. Of the <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, you moved to California, so you got to be weird. Well, I moved to California when I was seven because my dad oh. had a job out here. Yeah, but the people look at California as being a weird state anyway. So maybe because you were here, you you became weird. Yeah. Who knows? All right. Any other questions, thoughts about this topic? Smaller group today, so less less people to ask questions. Thank you very much, Barry. I'm going to sign off. Okay. Well, thank you for watching. Um, again, the replay will be available in the group and definitely watch the beginning and the previous one i talked about will also be in the group um you can watch that as well so that's it thank Thanks you very so. you're very welcome very welcome and i'll probably see you again i'm, I'm guessing mia's gonna have me back in the group again sometime down the road she seems like having me in the group and people like what i'm talking about so i'll be back again soon so again okay. thanks for watching and uh everyone take care of yourself and uh, i'll see you again soon all right all right bye